WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has agreed to plead guilty to violating the Espionage Act, ending a court case that has lasted nearly six years. He is set to plead guilty to one charge of conspiracy to obtain and disclose national defense information. Now, a short while ago, WikiLeaks said on X, formerly Twitter, that Assange left a British prison on Monday and flew out of the United Kingdom, and they released this video footage showing the founder boarding a flight at London Stansted Airport at 5 p.m. local time. The guilty plea, which is set to be finalized on Wednesday, will resolve Mr. Assange's outstanding legal matters with the U.S. government. As part of that deal, Assange will not spend any time in custody because he will receive credit for the approximately five years he has spent in a British prison fighting extradition to the U.S. Now, he was charged with conspiracy to obtain and disclose national defense information. And for years, the U.S. argued that the WikiLeaks files, which disclosed information about the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, endangered lives. Assange founded WikiLeaks in 2006. The organization claims to have published more than 10 million documents in what the U.S. government later described as one of the largest compromises of classified information in the history of the United States. He and his lawyers have long claimed that the case against him is politically motivated. And for more on the case, I spoke to our North America correspondent, Nomia Iqbal. Nomia, you're following this. Tell us more about this agreement. Well, it's interesting because although he has been in jail in the, the UK since 2019, the, the actual story of Julian Assange has been running for, for more than a decade, hasn't it? So his, uh, his WikiLeaks website rose to prominence in 2010. You mentioned there this uh, breach that the Americans said, largest of its kind in US military history. Uh, WikiLeaks released more than 90,000 classified US military documents on uh, Afghanistan war, then also released more than 400 400,000 secret documents on the Iraq war, and he's long been accused of putting American operatives' lives at risk. Um, as you mentioned, that almost all the charges that he faced um, were under this Espionage Act, um, and he won't spend any time in the U.S. Uh, once he enters this, uh, this plea, which uh, is expected to be finalized later this week, because it's roughly equivalent to the amount of time that he has spent in the U.K. fighting extradition to the U.S. As you said, this has been running for such a long time, if we're not talking just specifically about the court case. How significant is this agreement? I think it's a big, big moment, um, you know, especially for Julian Assange's advocates. He has, uh, you know, a lot of allies who believe that he was just doing a, a job of a journalist uh, by releasing uh, all these documents. They believe he um, is a figurehead for free speech. I think that was slightly complicated back in 2016, if you remember, when WikiLeaks released large volumes of emails from the Democratic National Committee and also from a personal account of John Podesta, who was then the um, uh, presidential campaign leader for Hillary Clinton. And many Democrats had accused him of collaborating with the Russians, which he denied. Um, but uh, it is a big moment. Uh, and it does put, I think, this saga to an end. Uh, the Biden administration has been under pressure by the Australians, which is a, they're a key ally for the Americans, a key security ally to end this legal limbo. And it looks like that is going to happen now this week. OK, take us through what happens next, because we understand there will be a hearing in the Mariana Islands. Why and, and what's going to happen? It is it is a bit of a twist, isn't it? It's an exotic venue, so it's expected to be finalised um, on Wednesday at the U.S. District Court in the Northern Mariana Islands. It's a U.S. territory in the South Pacific. It's around about 2,000 miles from Australia. And I think, first of all, that's convenient, because the, the Department of Justice has said they expect him to return back to his home in Australia. But also, looking at the DOJ letter, um, they've also pretty much implied that that's what he wants to do, that he does not want to voluntarily return to the continental US. And I think that's because, you know, he harbours this deep mistrust of the, the US government, and he has long spoken about that. At one point, he and his allies accused the US of allegedly trying to kill him with a drone, which the US obviously denied. So I think that's that's why, you know, that particular venue has been chosen. And the Department of Justice has said that they anticipate that he will appear in, in, in the court there on Wednesday. Now, I also spoke to Monique Ryan. She's an Australian member of parliament and has been following this case. First of all, I just want to get your reaction to this agreement. 
It's a source of uh, uh, significant relief to millions of Australians that we understand today that there's been significant progress uh, on the case of Julian Assange. We don't have at this point confirmation of exactly where things are. We know that things are underway in terms of ongoing legal proceedings, but millions of Australians want him home. We've felt concern for his welfare for many years, and it's, it's the, the news that his release or these proceedings, have, there's been significant progress on them, has been very warmly welcomed in this country. Yeah, we did see that video released by WikiLeaks on uh, X, formerly Twitter, uh, appearing to show Mr. Assange boarding a flight in London. I mean, you did travel to the U.S. previously to advocate on Mr. Assange's behalf to lawmakers here. I'm curious to hear, what was the reception like? Do you think that there will be support for this agreement here? Well, uh, look, I, I travelled to the US at, at the end of last year as part of a nonpartisan delegation with a number of parliamentarians from across the political spectrum in Australia. And what we were doing was reflecting the desires of our constituents, which is that we advocate on behalf of Julian Assange and on behalf, I would say, of press freedom globally, in fact. And, and, and when we went to the US and we talked to our colleagues and our uh, uh, equivalent numbers in the Congress, we heard the same thing from them, that they were really concerned uh, about this individual and how his case had become, I, I would say, politicised to some extent and, and about his personal welfare. And so we, we received a warm welcome when we went to Washington because we felt that when we spoke about the importance of press freedom and about the Australian-American in, uh, uh, international alliance, that the people we were speaking to were speaking the same language and, and heard what we were, had to say. Do you think, Monique, that that relationship with Australia did perhaps make a difference? I think it does. And I think the fact that Australia and the US have long had very firm, very warm uh, political relations means that we should be able to have difficult conversations about issues with our citizens. I understand that the Australian government has been advocating on Mr Assange's behalf for a long time. Many of my constituents have been asking me to advocate to the Prime Minister, and I understand that he's been working with President Biden on this because many Australians have been saying for years now that enough is enough and that it's time for Julian Assange to come home. I want to ask you about some of the criticisms of Julian Assange's Action. So just in February at a hearing in London, the U.S. government had still been arguing that Mr. Assange put lives at risk. We've seen CIA and State Department officials in the past say that civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, human rights activists, opposition figures, that they were forced into hiding and that indeed the actual impact of the leaks could not really be quantified but were significant. What's your response to that? Well, I, I guess my response would be that in 2013, the State Department at Chelsea Manning's trial acknowledged that they had no specific evidence, in fact, that any individuals had been placed at significant risk by the, the WikiLeaks um, actions of WikiLeaks and of Mr Assange. So it's difficult to reconcile that, I guess, with things that the State Department may have said more recently, uh, I think you'd probably need to talk to representatives um, of that State Department ag about that. But, you know, it's, it comes back to, I think, for many Australians, the importance of press freedom, which we see as being under threat in this country, and we see it as being under threat in the UK and the US as well. It's very important that journalists have the right to tell inconvenient truths and to bring to the public attention things which are perhaps not, you know, may not be perceived by politicians as being in their best interest or the best interest of government. Free press, uh, the free media uh, is under threat globally. And we saw this particular case as emblematic of that. And so I think that many Australians, and I hope people globally, will gain heart from the fact that in this instance, we've seen that the freedom of the press be supported by, hopefully, uh, as we understand, the US and Australian governments. And Monique, we just have about 30 seconds left, but how significant do you think this moment is, if you can sum it up for us? Well, I know Julian Assange's family. I've worked with them closely for some years. You know, the, the news of his impending possible, hopefully, potential release or the, the settlement of these proceedings has brought tears to, to many Australians. This is a really going to be a very emotional day for 
thousands and thousands of people who feel incredibly strongly about this in, Aust in Australia. And I give my support and love to all of those people who've worked on his behalf. And I thank the Australian and American governments for working towards uh, resolution of proceedings which have uh, gone on for too long.